Hello, my name is Alfredo. Welcome to my piano space time. In this video, you will find my study discussion about Johannes Brahms' Romance in F major. This video might be of real interest if you intend to study this piece at the piano, as I will present a few thoughts about what I understood while working on this piece to learn it. Before starting with my considerations, uh, let's play a part of it to warm up. Let's say first a few words about the structure. So you can easily see by looking at the score that uh, the piece is composed by three sections. The third section, that is brief, is using the same musical ideas and material that we find in the first se section. And uh, it uh, develops into a brief coda. Section two has a contrasting character, spirit with respect to section one. And even in uh, technical terms, uh, it is quite different in the writing. It requires a very different technical and physical approach compared to section one. I think that uh, before starting putting our hands on the keyboard for section one, it's important to identify, I believe, five fundamental ideas. And uh, I would say that um, Three of these ideas are children of the first one, so working on, on them is kind of um, establishing our ability to express what comes first. I will be now specific. The first thing is that you can easily realize that uh, this piece in section one is written with uh, a non-pianistic writing. I believe that the conception of the score is uh, like for music of a string ensemble. Instead, the, the writing is polyphonic, and more than that, is a, a counterpoint writing, because what might seem at first sight uh, a series of chords is actually uh, the overlapping of uh, melodic lines, and each of them has a very nice and, uh, how to say, well sound uh, character, it draws a melodic line that is very nice. And so this, I think, suggests that actually the sound reference, the musical idea, is the one of a, a string quartet or a string quintet. I leave it to you to be more specific. If you decide to agree with this idea, um, I think uh, the first mission that we have is uh, ideally to play the piano to produce uh, a string ensemble sound. Let's be more pragmatic. I think uh, we have to um, be mindful to play our piano to minimize the percussive character that is, it has inherently. And uh, what does it mean in practical terms? Well, it means uh, that here is very important a concept that is on average important, a good concept in the majority of piano pieces, but here I think is very much, how to say, on the front line. 
And this is the fact that we have to develop the ability of playing these, let's call them chords for a second. Actually, vertically speaking, we have to, to play chords, right? So we have to do this with a gradual action, I believe. So let, let's imagine like our keyboard is a sort of long pillow, a very soft layer, and we find the sound when we reach the bottom of this layer, and we have to be careful not to hit that bottom with too much energy, or we would instead, how to say, uh, hit the wood underneath and the sound would be spoiled by that. And, uh, well, this is easy to say, but not so easy to do. And I believe it requires our um, mindful approach. We have to keep this in mind to monitor our action when grasping these chords. And, you know, um, one step forward in this concept to see it in practical terms. I believe that it is essential to, to train to, to exercise a cooperation by the arm action and the fingers. Because at the piano, uh, generally, the arm is the part of the body that provides, can provide the right amount of energy to have our strings to produce, to vibrate in a nice and round way. But the arm alone, uh, without a good cooperation by the fingers can easily deliver a too harsh amount of energy. Vice versa, the fingers, if we leave the fingers alone, uh, very easily will incur in the problem of producing a pale sound, especially when we play chords. And so once again, uh, a big part of our work at this piece, I believe, is to train this cooperation in having the arm providing energy and we have to study in a way that uh, we deliver the right dose of the energy to the keyboard and the fingers with their natural grasping capability are the ones that filter, integrate, makes possible to grasp the right chord and when it is needed to highlight one note in the chord that in that particular moment might be a more important element for the melodic line that we are working. So this was the first point, a bit elaborated, right? So basically, once again, is to be conscious about the orchestral nature of this first page, of this first section. And this is linked to the idea of working on our capability of gradually uh, attack each of these chords if we want to see them in a while as a number of chords in progression. The second idea, in a way we already touched that, I said something already, is um, since it is a polyphonic writing, uh, we have to pay attention that we have uh, vertical sound consistency in the chord. And there are moments in which that is not at all so easy. It requires a bit of exercise, of training, to, to make sure that Each of them is present in the sound image I am producing, and this applies for each step that I am doing. Once again, uh, cooperation between energy from the arm and the finger grasping is the way. The third point is again containing what we are saying, but it's important, I think, to have that clear in mind. Each of the lines the in the polyphony here um, are nice melodies that have uh, their important role, sometimes to support uh, and reach what the main singing line is doing, and sometimes that line instead becomes the protagonist in the moment. For instance, uh, I give you a question. 
Mm, which one is the singing melody at the very beginning? Is it the soprano? Why not? Or is it the contralto? That, by the way, is doubled at the tenor note. So, um, I don't give the answer because I don't have the right answer. However, they are clearly both important. And uh, so, in these two bars, actually three, four, <laughs> they carry the role of the, probably the leading person in the family that is now playing or singing. Yes, I think soprano, contralto, sometimes with the tenor, are kind of uh, leading uh, the singing idea, but there are moments where the bass, I would say the tenor, becomes very expressive and uh, despite not being the singing melody, but it's so important to generate that warmth that this beautiful piece can offer. I'm talking about here. Do you see this is, I think, a cello playing? line that at the beginning was the contralto and the tenor that is doubled and goes in the soprano. Do you see it? It is what was happening at the beginning here. And what we had at the soprano at the beginning is still here at the contralto. So, the third point is to monitor our horizontal coherence in each line. So, it is something, I believe, very, uh, very, very near. It's the same thing that we have to work on if we study a fugue by, by Bach, I believe. And the method of working on it, I believe, it's, it's the same. And uh, we'll go to that practically. The fourth point is Again, one of the three children of the first, that is establishing a nice legato. And this is a, a very uh, tricky word at the piano. Uh, can be a bit dangerous uh, because the game is not simply to search for physical um, connectivity between one key and the next one. And often you will see by yourself that's impossible. But that's not the case because we might apparently connect nicely one note and the other, but we might hear a sort of, hmm, how to say, percussive sequence of, of sounds. So the game is, as I said many times in many videos, it's not really my idea, of course. Uh, legato means uh, to establish a flowing, gentle, smooth, action with your playing mechanism in a way that the sound of one note compared to the one before is in a sort of volume good consequentiality. And this is a problem with the piano as you hit a note immediately there is a decay differently than with a string or with a flute where with the bow action or with the uh, blowing action, you can hold that note until the next, right? So we have to create a sort of illusion of legato thanks to our action. Of course, the pedal will integrate this, but first of all, we have to work without pedal in a way that we don't pretend to, to become mad in, in searching connection that are not possible or detrimental to fluidity, but instead to maintain fluidity and consequentiality. The last point, the fifth point is, I think it's related to the, the tempo. 
to the tempo indication. So this is an andante. Andante uh, for me is a, is a very nice word because so it's not, of course, it's not a largo, it's not even an adagio. So it's not a fast tempo, but it is not a slow tempo. And andante is a word that in Italian contains, you know, the meaning of uh, to go. There is movement inside. So I believe that here um, the risk is that uh, we can develop a way of playing these chords in a very static way. And this is not an andante. Instead, we have to work uh, to refine our action so that we can perceive and hopefully uh, make perceivable a kind of a bass rhythm flowing, right? Something that is going. So uh, we have to work in a way to establish a direction in the music. Like we know that while we play a chord, we can feel that another one is coming. And then this never stops until the end. And we'll see practically um, what I believe might be a way to develop a bit uh, of uh, effectiveness in this. So there were a lot of words, right? Might be a good idea to, to write a couple of key words for each point in a sticky note and put it there beside your score so that every day, I believe it's important to start with a mindful approach, having in mind these things that has to be present at any second of our work on this nice piece. Now let's be practical. Uh, my intention is for two, perhaps four bars to be a bit, how to say, uh, detailed and uh, uh, kind of trying to show practically how to cover all the five points. And then I won't do this for all the page, otherwise the video will take probably three hours or so. And uh, I will perhaps complete by playing uh, once or twice with separate hands the lines so that however you can see the fingering I'm using, perhaps this might be of some help in considering what you want to do with these notes. All right, first left hand. understood a bit the notes, let's try to improve the sounds. Let's see the right hand. start familiarizing with the notes. Now let's work on the action. And here uh, we have, uh, we can or, or we should, depending on how it comes, um, stay on one single chord and then perhaps move to the next one and playing the two chords in sequence several times until we feel that our action, our cooperation, arms and fingers is kind of working and we became more solid in what we are doing. By the way, the piece starts with this. It's the sixth quarter in the bar that is in silence. So I suggest to play at least two quarters in your mind and then to grasp this C that is not a main beat note, but is a note preparing to the main beat that we start in the next bar. say that in this process initially you might start with more sound than necessary 
it's a good way to get the chord under your fingers and hands and then I modulate, I try to soften it. Here we don't have a piano indication, a fourth indication, we have espressivo. Uh, clearly, I believe it is not a forte texture, but something between piano and the mezzo forte, right? Most, most of all, we wanted to have a good presence of each notes vertically of the polyphony in the chord. And be gradual. Remember, like I'm playing a pillow and the sound is at the bottom of the pillow. That is a sensitive layer because if I reach that too hard, I will uh, hit the wood underneath and the sound will be mixed with the noise. This is what I don't want. Let's keep going. Not so easy this chord, for me at least. So now we worked on the homogeneity vertically. Now uh, let's start familiarizing with the melodic development of each line. So let's take the soprano, let's hear it clearly. Now I want to play it in, uh, how to say, with a stronger volume with respect to the other, uh, to train my body to follow this line, to give to, to her importance, just as a matter of familiarizing with it, with all the rest that is going on in the lower voices. <laughs> And I will repeat this process for each line. Now I will focus on, well, it's not of much interest, the C here. This will come a bit naturally. Let's go to the contralto and Let's, for the time being, leave the tenor a bit underneath in some volume. I want to see what I feel in my fingers, in my heart, in my body, with the sound coming out from this particular voice. The tenor. Finally, the bass. 
on three of the five points I've mentioned. The gradual action and the uniformity vertically of our polyphony. And we started working on our melodic coherence in familiarizing with each of the lines in this counterpoint writing. So now uh, let's go to the legato. That, as I said, doesn't mean to uh, search for impossible physical connections, but rather to establish a flowing, smooth action of, of our movements when playing these chords. Of course, when I can, when I find it comfortable, I do connect the notes, but where this is not possible, I don't care about stretching or sliding, no, often is detrimental. Instead, I care about maintaining a good sound consequentiality, and later with the pedal, I will smoothen down everything. needed. that is the andante, right? We wanted to not simply play ta 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 but ta 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 So let's start isolating the, the main beats and feel them in our physical action, how they feel. many times as we need to develop a physical presence in this, how to say, long line rhythm. And then we start filling up. is what uh, we can do for each of the bars of this page. So I will not repeat all these methods because it would become very boring for you and, and very, long, very long, but I think what I had to explain is this. However, I feel I will still play these lines to show you uh, the fingering I'm using, so hands separately first and a couple of times each line. Notice here we have the first explicit dynamic indication, that is the crescendo and the diminuendo, right? Explicit because Brahms is writing expressive at the beginning, expressive. Uh, we'll come on that in a second. But first, uh, let's be conscious about this crescendo here. at least in this piano with this room, um, 
here there is a brief moment where I like to put on a chord at the end of the diminuendo to kind of extend the diminuendo, making, making it more audible. It's the only point, and I think another point where there is another diminuendo where I touch the una corda in this section, I feel that it requires a, a uniformity in color, so I don't feel that I want to change between una corda and three strings continuously. No, I believe I want to play this with all the strings, except, as I said, in a couple of very brief moments, like here, to underline the diminuendo. Take the E with the left hand here. So. Hands together. about the indication espressivo, expressive. Well, this is a, a profound subject, so it would deserve, you know, not a video, I don't know how many videos, so mm, I cannot develop here anything about that. Mm, my suggestion is, if you, if you like the idea, uh, to go to see a video that um, I have posted in the description notes by Polish concert pianist Greg Niekczuk, uh, where he actually presented a, a nice presentation uh, digging into uh, the concept of uh, interpretation, espressivo, when dealing with the piano, with the keyboard, and what to do practically to explore this dimension and to develop our own way of expressing that. I personally appreciate it very much that uh, discussion, I invite you uh, to go and see that. However, said in very few words, in sufficient words, uh, we had better to explore uh, where our expressivity might go or shouldn't go. Uh, like mm, trying in highlighting notes here and there, hearing what it sounds, uh, with no fear to make things that are inappropriate. It's part of the process. Exploring means to, to try, to test, and to decide, hmm, this is good, this is not good, right? So uh, I try to do perhaps something stupid to give the idea. here if I insert a little crescendo and doing this I think it develops however our ability to, to control little variations in, in touch in, in a little rubato and these things uh, so that of course the point is not to identify a, a rigid set of uh, adjustments in terms of expressiveness but to develop a bit of freedom in what we are doing. So that will be a bit of improvisation when we do it. So we start with a certain sound intensity and we develop to a lower, to a higher intensity, depending on how we feel in that moment. Let's keep going.
have uh, a crescendo with the ritardando at the end of this part and the ritardando based on the addition I'm using keeps going until uh, the restart of the main theme where there is a piano so we have to consider this Here, uh, let's see a couple of details. We have the first explicit piano noted down, and so we have to pay attention with our action and touch because we have five notes. It's not that easy to play piano, but this is very important because then we can uh, express this crescendo and we have this più espressivo, more expressive noted. And uh, we start seeing a lot of movement in the cello line, very beautiful and requires a bit of care in, in studying it. Here you realize that we are repeating uh, with some variations at the second bar of this pair that I just played. We are repeated what happened at bar 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So uh, at a certain point they should be studied, I think, together so that once you have, you have completed preparing the 
first two bars, you work just on the modifiers in this repeat section. And doing this also, you can focus, you can realize better the little differences even in the expression marks, right? So here we have a piano, dolce, a crescendo, a diminuendo. If you go back to those same bars over there, apart those few um, notes, harmonies that change in the second half of the second bar of this pair, you were having different expression marks. So in a way, I think we should consider this and reflect that while, while we are playing. Notice that here there is a little trick. I split between the two hands the last quarter in the first bar of this pair. So the right hand is.